On September 12, 1982, two off-duty Alaska police officers were off hunting in a very remote section of Alaska, about 20 miles away from Anchorage. The only way to get out to this area was by plane or by boat, and so generally speaking, the only people that came into this area were big-time hunters. After a long day, the two men realized it was starting to get dark and they were still deep in the woods, and so they decided it was time to turn around and start heading back to camp. The journey through the woods was challenging, and so the men walked down to the nearby Kinnick River and walked across an exposed sandbar. And as they walked, they noticed up ahead there was a boot sticking out of the sand. And as they got closer, they realized it wasn't just a boot, there was also a human leg bone still in the boot. Being police officers, they knew the importance of not disturbing a potential crime scene, and so instead they marked on the map where they were, they left the area, and they reported the body to their department. The following day, crime scene technicians came out to that remote area and they very carefully unearthed the remains, which still had women's clothing on them. And then afterwards, they began searching for evidence in the area and eventually they discovered a single shell casing that was a 223 caliber round, which is a common caliber for hunting rifles. The remains were sent back to the lab for an autopsy and it was revealed this person was a female and she had most likely died at least six months earlier. And she had almost certainly been the victim of a homicide because she had died from three gunshot wounds. Also during the autopsy, it was discovered that there were no bullet holes on any of her clothing. And so it appeared that she had been shot without her clothes on and then her killer presumably redressed her. Also, they found a hospital bandage wrapped up in her clothing that appeared to have been wrapped around her head, leading some to speculate that she had been blindfolded before she was shot. A couple of weeks after the autopsy, dental records came back and they identified the body as belonging to 23-year-old Sherry Mar. Sherry was an exotic dancer from Anchorage who had been reported missing 10 months earlier. In her missing persons report, it was stated that the last thing she told her friends was she had been offered $300 to have pictures taken of her by a professional photographer, and she was going to meet this man right before she disappeared. While police were fairly certain that Sherry's killer was this so-called photographer, they had no evidence that would allow them to search for this person. They had nothing. All they had was this shell casing that was commonly used amongst hunters hunters and there's lots of hunters in Alaska. So the police reported the finding of Sherry's body to the media in hopes that when they put that out to the world that someone from the public would reach out with more information. During the police's press conference, one of the reporters asked them, you know, do you think Sherry's death is connected to the other unsolved deaths in that part of Alaska? What they were referencing was two years earlier, two other women's bodies had been discovered in that rough area where Sherry had been found. One of the women was so badly decomposed there was no way to identify her. However, it was revealed she was probably in her late teens or early 20s. The other woman was able to be identified. It was 24-year-old Joanne Messina, who was an exotic dancer from Anchorage. But there was virtually no evidence at either of the two women's grave sites, and so their deaths remained a mystery. Publicly, at this press conference, the police told reporters that they did not believe Sherry's death was connected to those two other women. But privately, some officers had their suspicions. Not only had these three women met similar fates in a similar area, but over the past couple of years, there had been a significant increase in missing people out of Anchorage, Alaska. And most of these missing people were young women that were either exotic dancers or prostitutes. This convinced many officers that they were dealing with a serial killer, but there just wasn't any evidence to actually prove it, so they couldn't come out and say it publicly. Over the following year, no new information came out about Sherry Morrow or the other two deceased women that had been found in that same area. And so all three of their cases just continued continued to languish. Meanwhile, more and more exotic dancers and prostitutes were going missing out of Anchorage, and no one knew why. Then, on June 13th, 1983, the police got a break. Early that morning, a man driving a truck turned onto a quiet Anchorage highway, and as he was making his way down the road, he saw up ahead on the side, there was this woman running towards him, screaming with her hands over her head, and she wasn't wearing pants or shoes. And so obviously he knew something was wrong, and so he pulled over, and as this woman is charging up towards him, he notices she has a handcuff on one of her wrists, and she appears to be a lot younger than he initially thought. She's probably in her late teens. And so she comes running up to his car. He unlocks the passenger side door. She flings herself inside without even asking for permission. She slams the door behind her and then ducks down to keep her head out of the window like she's trying to hide from something out there. Now, this man looked out and he didn't see anyone or anything, but he wasn't going to wait around for whatever it was she was scared of. And so he just made 
made a gut decision to take this girl away from here. And so he peeled off and drove down the road. And the girl, who was very shaken up, couldn't even tell this guy what was going on. She just asked him to please drop her off at a nearby motel. And the man didn't ask any questions. He drove her to the motel and he dropped her off. The girl ran inside and up to her room. And when she ran inside, the motel receptionist sees this girl running in. I mean, she doesn't have her pants on. She's got a handcuff on. She looks terrified. And so she called the police. A few minutes later, the police showed up. They went up to this girl's room. They knocked on the door. The girl opened it up and she was obviously very scared and she allowed the police inside and she told them her name was Cindy Paulson and she was 17 years old. The police recognized this girl is terrified. She's not a threat. And so they removed the one handcuff that was still on her. And then they asked her, you know, what happened? And the police officers would say her story was just horrible. But what stood out to them was not how disturbing the story was. It was how composed and brave this girl was as she told it. This is her story. The night before, Cindy was working the streets of Anchorage. She was a prostitute and a car pulled up and inside was this wiry bearded guy with glasses who seemed kind of slight and harmless and he asked to buy her services. And because she didn't view him as a threat, she agreed and hopped in his passenger seat. And as soon as she sat down, he reached over and put a handcuff on one wrist and then drew a gun on her and told her to be quiet. And then he drove her to this fairly nice neighborhood, pulled into a driveway. He got her out of the car and led her into this house and he brought her along downstairs into the basement where as soon as she got down there, there was a dim light and she saw there was a chain swinging from the ceiling. And he strung her up onto that chain and for hours he assaulted her. And then after he grew tired of doing that, he told her he was gonna go take a nap and when he came back, they were gonna leave this house and go out to his cabin in the woods. At this point, she begged him to let her go, but he really didn't care. He just told her that if she made any noise or tried to escape at any point, he would have to kill her and then he walked out of the room. And for the next several hours, Cindy remained chained to the ceiling with half of her clothes off, wondering what horrible thing was gonna happen to her next. Eventually, her attacker came back in the room and he untied her from her chain and he walked her upstairs to his living room where he very proudly showed her a number of hunting trophies he had and he began telling her about how much he loved hunting and where he went hunting. And it was at this point that Cindy realized this guy has no intention of keeping her alive. He's shown her his face, his house, House, his car. He's told her about places he likes to go and things he likes to do. He's given her all this information about himself. She is a huge liability to him. And so it dawned on her that if she didn't find a way to escape, she was going to die. After the trophy tour, the man led Cindy back out to her car, he put her inside, and then he drove to a nearby small airport where he said his plane was. And so he pulled over to their hangar, he got her out of the car, and he put her inside of the plane. And as Cindy is sitting in the plane, she's watching this guy load gun after gun and bag after bag of what looks like military supplies into this plane. And so she knows that this is the moment. I have to escape right now because as soon as this plane takes off, I'm done for. And so at some point when this guy went over to his car to get something, and his back was turned to her, she jumped out of the cockpit of this plane, she fell to the ground, she got up and just began running out of the hangar. And she managed to get out of the hangar and began turning the corner and running towards this forest right as she hears this guy charging after her, screaming that he's gonna catch her and kill her. And so she just keeps running for her life all the way into this forest, all the way to that highway before she finally stopped and turned around and she saw the man had stopped following her. This is when she went onto the highway and she flagged down the guy in the truck who brought her to the motel. The police were shocked by her story. It sounded totally unbelievable, but she was so genuinely scared and so detailed that they believed her. And so they told her they would have to bring her to the hospital and on their way to the hospital, she demanded they go back to that airport that she had been held at so she can try to identify the hangar she had been in and hopefully the plane would still be in there. And so the police comply, they go into the airport and Cindy points out the hangar she believes she was in and when they get there, the plane she had been on was still there, but the man, her attacker, was not there. And so the police got out and they began taking down notes about the plane, its different tag numbers and what it looked like. And while they're standing there, the security guard from the airport came over because he saw the police cars and he told the officers that the night before he had seen the owner of the plane they're looking at acting very suspiciously with something inside of his car. And so on a hunch, he had recorded that man's license plate number and he gave that number to police. 
police. And so the police were able to use that license plate number and some of the numbers on the plane to figure out who owned both vehicles. And it was a local man named Robert Hansen who owned a very successful bakery downtown. After dropping Cindy off at the hospital, the police officers decided to pay a visit to Robert Hansen at his house. When they got there, Robert was actually pulling into his driveway right at the same time, and they saw his car matched the description that Cindy had given of his car. And then when Robert got out of his car, he matched the description that Cindy had given of her attacker. When Robert saw the police parked outside of his house, he immediately invited them over and said, you know, what can I help you with? And the police said, we'd like to talk to you. Can we go inside? Robert invited them inside, and when the police went into his house, it matched the description that Cindy had given of his house with all the hunting trophies everywhere. And so they sat down and they asked him what he was doing the night before. And he said he had spent the night with some friends and he had their contact information. And if you needed to talk to them, you could, but they would say he was with them. When the police asked if they could have a look around his property, Robert immediately consented and said, you can look anywhere you want. And so the police searched his property, but found no signs that Cindy had been attacked there. And so they thanked him for his hospitality and they left. Once they got back to their station, they checked in with Robert's two friends he claimed he was with the night before, and they each independently corroborated Robert's story, saying that yes, he was with them from this time to this time. And so it appeared, as unlikely as it seemed, that Robert was telling the truth. And so the police went back to Cindy and they said, you know, are you sure that everything you told us is exactly as you remember it? You didn't exaggerate anything. You know, this is the truth. And Cindy said, absolutely. And they said, okay, well, are you prepared to take a lie detector test to prove that you're telling the truth? And Cindy said, no. Now, it's unclear why she said no. Maybe it was a general distrust of the police. But either way, when she said no, it immediately cast an enormous amount of doubt on her story in the eyes of the police. And when Cindy started to pick up that the police really didn't believe her anymore, she got spooked and just left town. And after that, her case and Robert Hansen were largely forgotten about. But three months later, on September 2nd, all of that changed. On that day, a construction crew was doing some work on a backcountry road not far from where those three women's bodies had been found. And at some point, one of their machines uncovered some human remains. The police were called in, who pulled up the rest of the remains. And then just like in Sherry Morrow's case, when they looked for evidence around this new body, they found a single shell casing from a 223 caliber round. The remains were brought back for an autopsy where it was determined that the body was female and she had died from several gunshot wounds. Using dental records, they were able to identify this woman as being 17-year-old Paula Goulding, who was an exotic dancer who had gone missing five months prior from Anchorage. The police sent the 223 shell casing found in Paula's gravesite, along with the other 223 shell casing found in Sherry Morrow's gravesite, to a lab to be analyzed. And it was quickly determined that both of these rounds had been fired from the same rifle. And therefore, both women had most likely been killed by the same person. This was the moment the police knew they were dealing with a serial killer. And many police officers wanted it to be Robert Hansen. He seemed like the guy, but he had a rock solid alibi and they had no hard evidence against him. And so without any other suspects, the police turned to a famous FBI profiler, a guy by the name of John Douglas, and they asked him to build a profile of who he think killed Sherry Morrow and Paula Goulding. And when John's report came back, the police were shocked. The profile described a man in his 40s who blended in easily with society. He was well-liked and got along with people and it was just a normal guy. And he was successful, probably because he owned a successful business. He was an avid outdoorsman and hunter, and he most likely had a significant speech defect, like a lisp or a stutter. The profile was perfectly describing Robert Hansen. And because of John Douglas's prolific success in correctly identifying killers based on his profiles, when a judge saw this particular profile and saw how neatly it lined up with Robert Hansen, he gave the FBI a search warrant for Robert's house. And this time they would find very damning evidence, like a map of the local area. It was a hunting map and on it there were 37 X's marked off. And some of those X's coincided with the same area where those four women's bodies had been found. They also found a 223 caliber rifle along with a bag of women's jewelry that contained a necklace belonging to Sherry Morrow. As the FBI was carrying evidence out of Robert's house into their truck, a neighbor walked over after seeing all the commotion and she walked up to one of the agents and she was very skittish and anxious and she said you know my husband he's friends with Robert and he recently
innocently pretended to be an alibi for Robert. He had no idea how much trouble he was in, and I certainly didn't know, but I want you guys to know that my husband was lying. He was not with Robert on the night that he said he was. This was the proverbial nail in the coffin for Robert Hansen, because now, without this alibi, he had nothing to hide behind. And so when the police approached Robert with their overwhelming evidence against him between what they found in his house and this now recanted statement from his former alibi, Robert said, okay, I'm going to confess. But there was a catch. He was only willing to confess to murdering the four women whose bodies had already been found by police. Now, the police knew Robert had almost definitely killed more people. And so at this point, they just wanted to know who the other victims were and where they were. And so they offered Robert a deal where he would confess to those four murders and then give additional information about other victims, where they were located, who they were, what happened to them. In exchange, they would not prosecute him on any other victims he named. And so Robert agreed to these terms. He signed the deal and then he gave a full, horrifying confession. He said he would drive around Anchorage at night and look for young, vulnerable women that were all alone. These were usually prostitutes out on the street or they were exotic dancers he would try to befriend inside of clubs. And when he approached these women, he would tell them he was a professional photographer and he thought they were beautiful and he wanted to take photos of them and he would pay them for the photo shoot. And many of these women were aspiring models and they were really excited at this idea and so they would agree to go. And so Robert would tell them to meet him the next day at a particular location, which was usually a fast food restaurant. And Robert would show up much earlier and he would hide in his car and he would wait to see when they showed up if they were alone or not. And when he saw they were alone and they had no one to help them, he would drive up and he would ask them to get in his car. What these women couldn't see was on the inside of the passenger side door was a handcuff that was already latched on to the door itself. And there was an open cuff waiting for them as soon as they got in. They would get in the car, he would reach over them and act like he was helping them put on their seatbelt. And then as they're kind of looking at him, wondering what he's doing, he would grab their wrist, throw it in the open handcuff, and then he would draw a pistol and hold it against their head and say, be quiet. During his confession, Robert bragged to police that he had done this so many times, putting the handcuff on and drawing the pistol, that it was like muscle memory for him. Once he had the women handcuffed inside of his car, he would drive them back to his house and he would bring them into his basement and he would chain them up to the ceiling, just like Cindy had described. And then after assaulting them for hours, he would take them out of his basement, put them in his car, drive out to the airport. He would put them in his plane, but unlike Cindy, these women didn't escape. And he would take off and he would fly them out to his cabin, which was not far from where those four bodies had been found. Once he got the women into his cabin, he would undress them and put a blindfold on them. And then with their handcuffs still on, he would assist them out the front door and tell them to run. And they would, they would take off as fast as they could in to the woods, running into trees, falling over, but just running for their lives, believing their ordeal was now over. They just had to get away from this guy. But what they didn't know is their ordeal was just starting. Robert had no intention of allowing them to escape. He knew there was deep water that surrounded his cabin. And so if they actually made it that far to the water's edge, they would drown. And so Robert would give these women a significant head start to give them the sense that they actually might escape. And then Robert would grab his knife and his hunting rifle and he would head out and begin stalking his prey. And for the next several hours or days, he would walk around the woods looking for these women and he would just stay off watching what they were doing. And at some point he would sneak up on them and he would wound them intentionally, usually with his knife. And then he had a blood trail to follow and he would follow these dying women who were screaming out for help. And at some point these women would know they were going to die. There was no hope for them and they would collapse or they would stop. And at that point, Robert would walk up to them and he would shoot them. Afterwards, he would remove their handcuffs, he would redress them, and then he would bury them in a shallow grave. Before he was carted off to prison to serve a life sentence without the possibility of parole, he was brought out by authorities to help identify where other grave sites were in that hunting area. But he was only able to find eight additional victims because he would go to different grave sites and the remains would not be there anymore, most likely because animals had ransacked the area, or he just simply forgot where it was, or he didn't want to share any more information with police. Robert never confirmed if all 37 of those X's on that map that was found are actual sites of victims that he buried. But investigators say that's exactly what they were. And in fact, many believe there are other maps with more X's on them. But the police could only confirm 17 victims. If there were more, we probably will never know. Because in 2014, Robert died in prison and he took those secrets to the grave.
The Sierra Madre Oriental is a major mountain range that starts on the southern border of Texas and Mexico and cuts 700 miles south through the northeastern section of Mexico. About halfway down this mountain range on the eastern face lies a series of caves. And situated below these caves at the foot of the mountains are several small villages that are very isolated and they're populated primarily with illiterate poor farmers. One night back in May of 1963, a 14-year-old boy named Sebastian Guerrero, who lived in one of these small isolated villages, decided to go for a walk up in the mountains and he wanted to go explore the different caves. Now, this was something he did fairly regularly because there was a local rumor that there was actually hidden treasure in these different caves. Now, it's unclear if Sebastian literally believed that or if that was just kind of an excuse to go have a look around himself. But regardless, he headed out of his house and he began walking up the mountain towards these caves. The entrance to these caves were a couple hundred feet up the mountainside and then each of the various entrances, which ranged in size from fairly small to enormous, were spread out a couple of miles in each direction. So Sebastian starts walking up the mountain towards the first entrance he can see. It's dark outside. He's got no flashlight. He's just walking up. And as he's walking, he notices off to his right, fairly far away from where he was, there was light coming out of one of the cave entrances. And he had never recalled seeing light coming out of any of these caves. Nobody ever went in these caves, especially not at night. Night. And so his interest was piqued and he decided he would kind of abandon his original plan to just kind of look around near his village and he would actually walk all the way over to that lit up cave and see what was going on. So he turned right and began kind of walking uphill at an angle in the direction of this lit up cave. And so as he's walking, he's getting farther and farther away from the village where he lives and he's starting to hear sounds coming out of this lit up cave entrance. It sounds like a person potentially either they're laughing or they're screaming. He doesn't really know. He's thinking, you know, maybe someone's having a party inside one of these caves. He has no idea. But after he gets maybe two or 300 feet away from this entrance, he realizes it's definitely a person and they're definitely screaming. And it does not sound like they're screaming out of joy. It sounds like they're screaming because they're scared or they're in pain. And as he's getting closer and closer and closer to this cave, his anxiety is starting to ramp up because he's really starting to be frightened by what he's hearing. And he's starting to realize there's more than one person inside of this cave. Cave. In addition to the person that is screaming out, there also sounds to be a large contingent of other people that are either singing in unison or chanting in unison, but some group of people are doing something in unison while some other person is screaming out. And so he's really starting to get nervous about this cave, but he just can't help feeling curious about what was going on. And so he just continued walking until he was maybe 10 feet away from the entrance to this cave and he plopped down behind a rock. And so he's not really sure if it's a good idea to look. He doesn't want to be spotted by whoever is in there. But finally, he kind of works up the courage. He takes a deep breath and he slips out from behind the rock and he goes right to the edge of this big opening, maybe 10 foot across opening. And he peeks his head right around the edge of the opening and he looks inside and what he sees causes him to just freeze in terror. Then his survival instincts just kick in and he turns and he starts running down the mountain away from this cave. He has no idea if he's been spotted or not, but he's sensing that someone could be chasing him. And so he is just running as if his life depended on it. And he would not run back to his village. Instead, he would run nearly 10 miles to the nearest police station. And when he gets there, he busts through the front doors and he's totally hysterical. He's drenched in sweat and the police officers are totally caught off guard. And so they're trying to tell him to calm down. And so Sebastian finally would kind of compose himself. But then he just was not able to describe what he had seen inside of this cave. Whatever he had seen, he knew it was bad, but the words were just escaping him. And so the way he described it to police was he basically thought he saw vampires. And as soon as he began describing vampires to the police, they're thinking to themselves, okay, I don't know what's going on with this kid, but this just cannot be serious. And so they consoled him and kind of calmed him down and said, look, kid, you know, I, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, if there's any news that comes out of something happening in the cave that's bad, you know, I'm sure we'll hear about it and we'll follow up. But for now, we're just going to bring you back to your village. And so at this, Sebastian was really frustrated and he was kind of pleading with the police like, no, you got to take me seriously. There's something bad happening in this cave. Someone could be hurt. Someone, someone could be dying. I don't know. But but you gotta go to this cave. You gotta go see what's going on. 
But the police at this point, they're just not really interested. And so they ultimately do just drive him back to his village. And so he goes back into his home. The police go back to their station and everyone just kind of goes to bed for the night. The next day when Sebastian wakes up, he just can't shake what he saw inside of that cave. And so he would once again run back to the police station. And when he got there, he began pleading with the police like, you got to go. You got to go see what's inside of this cave. I'm telling you, there's something awful in there. And this time, one of the police officers, his name was Luis Martinez, he would say, you know, okay, kid, bring me to this cave and, and I'll have a look around. And so Luis and Sebastian, who was very grateful, they left the police station, they hopped in a police car and they took off. And then later on in the day, the other police officers who were not really paying attention to this cave thing, they realized that Luis and the boy had not returned yet. And Luis had not checked in via his radio. And so at some point in the afternoon that day, the other officers began calling out to Luis. They began calling him on his radio and trying to figure out what's going on, but he wasn't responding. Responding. And so the police thought that was odd, but they thought, you know what, I'm sure he'll be back soon. There's got to be an explanation for this. But the rest of the day would go by without Luis reaching out to them and he didn't return with the boy. And so by that evening, the other officers were genuinely concerned that, you know, something bad had happened to their colleague. And so they tried calling Luis a few more times on the radio. It didn't work. And so the officers, they made their way over to Sebastian's village and they found Sebastian's family believing that, you know, maybe the boy was back and he could give some insight into where Luis went. But when they talked to Sebastian's family, they would say, hey, you know, he's not back yet either. And so both Sebastian and Luis at this point have not talked to anyone all day and they are missing. And so the police at this point, they realize this is an emergency. They need to figure out where these two went. And so they were kind of understaffed. And so they contacted the Mexican army and they explained, you know, we're missing one of our colleagues. We're missing a child from this village. And so the Mexican army would actually send out a military unit to assist them in going and finding these two people. And so the unit, they show up later that night and the police and the Mexican army, they head out to where this cave was. And when they saw what was inside the cave, it would shock the world. To understand what was found inside of this cave, we need to go back six months to December of 1962. That month, two brothers, Santos and Cayetano Hernandez, who made their living basically traveling around Mexico, stealing from people and swindling people, they decided they were going to pull off their biggest heist yet they were going to rip off an entire town. Their plan was to go into a small, fairly isolated village that was populated primarily with poor and illiterate people. And they would go in there and they would convince the villagers that they, the brothers, were actually prophets of an exiled Incan god. And if these villagers did everything they said, they would make them rich. And so the village the brothers identified as their target was a place called La Yerba Buena, which was located right at the foot of the Sierra Madre Oriental, right below where that cave was that Luis and Sebastian went to investigate. And La Yerba Buena was exactly what the brothers were looking for. It was home to only about 20 families that were all very poor and illiterate, and they were very suggestible. And so right before the new year, the Hernandez brothers strolled into La Yerba Buena, and they put on this very dramatic show explaining how they were the prophets of the sinking god and these two brothers they were very charismatic and they were excellent salesmen and so they really sold the lie and these villagers who were very vulnerable and cut off really from the rest of the world they believed them. They thought this was their big break. They're going to be rich. We just have to do whatever they say. And so almost immediately, the villagers effectively became the Hernandez brothers' slaves. They would give them anything they wanted and do anything they wanted. But after a couple of months of this, some of the villagers started to be frustrated with the Hernandez brothers, the prophets, because it seemed like they were not really working towards making the villagers rich. Instead, it just seemed like they were horribly mistreating the villagers. And it just didn't feel like this was a relationship that was benefiting the villagers. And so when this sentiment began to kind of make its way around the 70-ish people who lived in La Yerba Buena, the brothers picked up on it and they could have at that point just kind of abandoned their gig. At this point, you know, they've, they've robbed the town dry. There's nothing left for them to give to the brothers. But for whatever reason, the brothers decide instead to salvage their operation. And so the brothers, they leave the village and they go to a city that's relatively close by and they recruit this young woman named Magdalena Solis. She was a prostitute and they tell her, hey, you know, we have this con we're doing in La Yerba Buena where we're pretending to be prophets 
spirits of this ink and god and they're starting not to believe our lie and so we need you if you're willing to come with us and pretend to be an actual incan goddess and so when you show up they'll know that we were serious that we have a direct line to the incan gods and goddesses and they'll believe us again and they'll fall back in line and so magdalena she likes the idea of participating in this con and so she agrees to do it in exchange for some money and so she along with the hernandez brothers and magdalena's brother his name was eliezer and he functioned as her pimp those four people they went back to yerba buena and when they got there, the Hernandez brothers snuck Magdalena past all the villagers up to that cave up in the mountains. And they put her in the back of the cave. They kind of hid her behind some rocks and they dressed her up in an Incan goddess costume. And then once she was in there, the brothers went back down to the village and they rounded all the villagers up and said, come on, let's go up to the cave. We have a special ceremony for you. And so the villagers made their way up to this cave. And once they were all inside, the Hernandez brothers used some basic magic tricks and created basically a smoke screen. Once they had the smoke screen kind of billowing in the back of the cave, they secretly signaled to Magdalena who was behind the smoke screen and she knew that was her cue and she leapt through the smoke and she presented herself to the villagers for the first time and she declared herself to be a reincarnated Incan goddess and if you don't do what I tell you to do I'm going to kill you and so the message she was sending to the villagers was so intense they completely believed that this was an Incan goddess and therefore this was not a ruse the brothers were not lying to them this was all very real there's a real goddess in front of of us. And so they immediately fell right back in line. The plan worked exactly as the brothers wanted it to. However, there was an element of their plan they could not possibly have accounted for. And that was what Magdalena did next. Even though Magdalena was fully aware that what she was getting herself into was an act. It was a con. It was not real. Despite that, as soon as she jumped through the smoke and was standing in front of the villagers for the first time and saw the looks on these people's faces as they stared up at her and she saw their reverence for her, it had this profound impact on her. This is a woman who's never had control in her life. She's been a prostitute since a young age. And and here she is, the most powerful person in the room, and it's not even close. And it got to her head. And so when she left the cave that night, she literally believed she was a reincarnated Incan goddess, and she was not a merciful one. Within the first few days of her stay at La Yerba Buena, Magdalena used threats of violence on the villagers to completely take over the village. She very easily supplanted the Hernandez brothers at the top of the power structure. Now, the Hernandez brothers probably were quite surprised to see this happen because they were expecting Magdalena to play more of a prop role to keep them in power, not the other way around. But ultimately, they kind of just went along with it because through Magdalena's control over the villagers, they were able to continue to exploit the villagers. And so they were getting what they wanted out of this relationship. Within a few weeks of being in La Yerba Buena, Magdalena was not only abusing every villager in every horrible way imaginable, she also was becoming completely delusional. She convinced herself that in order to survive, she needed to start drinking blood. And so she demanded all the villagers provide her with blood and so in fear of retribution the villagers began slaughtering all of their farm animals and their own pets so magdalena could drink their blood for weeks and weeks and weeks the horrible abuse magdalena would dole out on the villagers would continue and these blood rituals would continue and then finally sometime in april two of the villagers decided, you know what? I've had enough. I don't believe Magdalena is actually an Incan goddess. I don't believe the Hernandez brothers are actually prophets. I think this is all a scam. And so they decided the way they would handle this is they were just going to flee the village. Now, somehow their plans to run away got out and the Hernandez brothers found out about it and they in turn told Magdalena about it. And when she heard the news, she immediately told everyone in the village to make their way up to the cave for a special ceremony. So all the villagers, including the two people that were planning on running away, they made their way up to the cave. And once everyone was inside, Magdalena walked to the front of the group and she pointed at the two dissenters, the two people that were planning
planning on running, and she demanded that the rest of the villagers kill them. And on the spot, all of the other villagers jumped on top of the two dissenters, and they lynched them. They beat them to death in the cave. And then after these two people have been killed, Magdalena orders their bodies be strung up on these two pikes she had set up in the back of the cave, because she knew what she was going to be doing up in this cave. And so after these two bodies were strung up on these pikes, Magdalena grabs a chalice, and she walks over to these two bodies, and she presses the chalice up against against their bodies, where they're bleeding from, and she fills it up, and then she drinks from the chalice. And at this point, everything changed. Suddenly, Magdalena understood that it wasn't good enough to just be drinking animal blood. That was not enough to keep her, a goddess, alive. She now could only consume human blood. And so for the next several weeks, Periodically, Magdalena would order everyone in the village to go back up to the cave for a blood ritual, which they all knew what this entailed. This no longer had anything to do with animals. This was human blood rituals. She would order them up and they would have no idea who was going to be the sacrifice. And so all these people, they get inside this dark cave and then Magdalena shows up and she stands in front of them. And after kind of looking them over, she identifies her next sacrifice and out of fear, the other villagers who were the friends and family of the victim would launch themselves on top of the chosen sacrifice and lynch them in the cave. And then afterwards, their body would be strung up on one of the pikes and Magdalena would walk over with her chalice. She would fill it with blood and she would drink it. And so this would go on and on for several weeks. And one of the most distressing aspects of these human sacrifices is that as she did more and more and more of them, Magdalena got it in her head that beating the sacrifice to death before consuming their blood was spoiling the blood in some way. And so what she began doing was she would have the other villagers beat the sacrifice into submission, and then she would have the sacrifice strung up to one of the pikes while they were still alive, and then she would carve their heart out while they were alive, and then she would drink their blood. So in May of 1963, when Sebastian, the 14-year-old boy, when he poked his head around and looked into that cave, he watched one of the sacrifices is having their heart cut out and he didn't know what to make of it and so he ran to the police and then the next day he and the police officer Luis Martinez they would go back to the cave and Magdalena and her cult would spot them capture them and drag them both into the cave and both of them would be ritualistically sacrificed they would have their hearts cut out and Magdalena would drink their blood when the police and army arrived in La Yerba Buena it was a ghost town because all of the villagers had been ordered up to the cave where they had barricaded themselves inside with weapons because Magdalena probably knew there was going to be a big police response because one of their officers has gone missing out here. They're bound to be found out. And so when the police and the army reach the cave, there's this big shootout with all of the villagers. And during the shootout, the majority of the villagers are killed. Also, the Hernandez brothers, they're also killed in the shootout. And then after the shootout stopped, the police and the army would go into this cave and they would discover the pikes, the bloody pikes that are in the back of the cave with bits of human remains all over the ground. And then they would leave the cave and they would search the town and they would find the remains of Luis and Sebastian outside a particular shack. And then inside the shack was Magdalena and her brother Eliezer. They were still alive. They were trying to hide from the authorities and so they would be arrested. It's believed Magdalena sacrificed and drank the blood of at at least 15 of the villagers over a six-week period. However, the only remains to be positively identified were Luis Martinez and Sebastian Guerrero. Ultimately, Magdalena and her brother Eliezer were sentenced to 50 years in prison, and all of the surviving villagers who participated in these sacrifices or who participated in the shootout with police and the army, they were given 30 years in prison. Amazingly, none of the villagers ever testified against Magdalena or her brother, despite the fact they were almost certainly offered reduced sentences in exchange for their testimony. Clearly, they were more terrified of the Incan goddess than they were terrified of the prospect of 30 years in prison. Although the exact date of when this happened is not known, Magdalena would eventually die behind bars. On August 28, 1984, an 18-year-old girl named Elizabeth went missing. 
On the first day she was gone, her friends and family went out looking for her, but they couldn't find her. The following day, when she still hadn't shown up and no one had heard from her, her parents went to the local police station in their Austrian town of Amstetten, which is about an hour west of Vienna, and they reported her missing. The police launched an initial search of the town and the surrounding areas, but after several weeks, they had found nothing that connected to Elizabeth and where she might have gone. A month after she had been reported missing, her parents came back to the police station, except this time they were carrying a note they say they received in the mail from their missing daughter. It was postmarked from a town that was about two hours west of Amstetten, and in this note, Elizabeth writes directly to her parents, and she tells them that she had grown tired of living with them, and she did not want them to come looking for her, and if she discovered they were looking for her, she would just flee the country. After the police read the note, they asked the parents if they thought it was real, if this was a legitimate letter from their daughter, and they said, yeah, they think it is. And then after that, her father, Joseph, suggested that maybe his daughter had run off to join a cult. That was something he thought she was getting into before her disappearance. After the parents left the police station, the police began conducting interviews with other family members and friends of Elizabeth to see if it was possible that she might have run off to join a cult. And virtually everyone they spoke to said, absolutely not. There is no way she ran off to join a cult. That just wasn't her. She was a quiet, reserved person, and they had never heard her talking about a cult or anything thing that even resembled a cult. These answers left the police feeling very suspicious of the whole situation, and so they decided to look into the young woman's history to see if there was some other reason she might have run off. In their research, they discovered that Elizabeth was one of seven siblings that all lived together with their parents, Joseph and Rose Marie. Joseph was a successful electrical engineer and real estate developer who was well-liked and respected in town, and Rose Marie had gotten married very young at the age of 17, and she had stayed home to take care of the kids. By all accounts, from the outside looking in, they were a a very ordinary family. But as the police began to dig deeper and deeper into their history, they discovered there were some big problems behind closed doors. Despite his friendly outward public appearance, Joseph was actually a ruthless authoritarian when he was home alone with his family. At night, when he came home from work, his wife and his kids would immediately stop whatever they were doing and go silent in hopes they might avoid a beating. The only member of the family that seemed willing to stand up to Joseph was Elizabeth. And she and her father would frequently get into screaming fights, and then as punishment for these fights, Joseph would not only beat his daughter, he would also prevent her from seeing her friends for long periods of time, and he would go through her personal things like her diary. Their toxic relationship finally came to a head when Elizabeth finally ran away from home two years prior to her most recent disappearance. She made it all the way to Vienna before authorities caught up to her and brought her back home. Upon learning about this earlier disappearance, the police became convinced that the most recent disappearance was yet another attempt to escape her abusive and controlling father. And so the police decided that this was more of a family affair and they didn't push the investigation further. A year went by and neither the police nor her family heard any Thing from Elizabeth, and so her case was closed. But 24 years later, a seemingly unconnected event broke her case wide open. On April 19, 2008, a 19-year-old named Kirsten was rushed to the hospital in Amstetten. Her skin was so pale it looked almost transparent. She was unconscious and suffering from seizures as well as lung and kidney failure. The doctors were able to stabilize her by putting her into a medically induced coma, but after running a litany of tests, they couldn't figure out what was causing her to have this medical condition, and so they were not able to treat her effectively. They assumed it had to be some sort of genetic condition, so they put her name into the medical database, but nothing Nothing came up. Her name wasn't listed. And so this was very perplexing because everybody's name was in this database. And so they took her name and they ran it in other medical databases and her name didn't show up in any of them. And so totally confused by this girl who seemingly didn't exist, who was exhibiting symptoms of a condition none of the doctors had seen before, the doctors decide they have to speak to the guy she showed up with, an older man who was out in the waiting room. When the doctors approached him, he said he was Kirsten's grandfather, but beyond that, he offered virtually no new information. In fact, he was aggressive and rude and dismissive, and anytime they asked him questions, he would answer as minimally as possible. And when the doctors really fixated on whether or not Kirsten had some underlying medical condition, he would not give them an answer. He would just dismiss it and say he didn't know anything, but it was the doctor's impression that he did know something, he just didn't want to tell them. And this behavior shocked them because they're thinking the information he has could potentially save his granddaughter's life. Why wouldn't he want to give it to us? 
And so after this disastrous interaction with the grandfather, the doctors decide to get the police involved. There were just too many red flags not to. When the police arrived, they were surprised to find out that this older man in the waiting room was none other than Joseph, the father of the still missing girl, Elizabeth. The police asked Joseph, what's going on here? And he tells them that earlier that day, he had opened his front door of his house and lying on his front step was a girl he had never seen before. It was Kirsten. And there was a note laying on her from his missing daughter. Elizabeth. In the note, Elizabeth writes to Joseph directly and tells him, this girl here is Kirsten and she is my daughter. So she's your granddaughter and she's sick and I can't take care of her. Can you and mom take her to the hospital? While the police had many more questions about this totally bizarre turn of events, they realized that for the time being, they needed to focus their efforts on just getting Elizabeth to contact them because they needed to know more about Kirsten's medical condition so they could save her life. And so the police went to the media and they put out a message on on TV and on radio that was a direct appeal to Elizabeth that basically said, we need you to come forward as soon as possible and speak to us so we can help save your daughter's life. And all the messages worked because a week later, Elizabeth, along with her father, Joseph, showed up at the hospital where Kirsten was staying. When doctors asked, Joseph did not get into detail about how he actually located Elizabeth. He simply said he found her and now she wants to see her daughter. The doctors noticed that Elizabeth, who was supposed to be in her early 40s, looked like she could easily be in her 60s. Her hair was completely white and her skin was so pale it was almost transparent, just like they had noticed about her daughter's skin. And so after they checked in, Joseph and Elizabeth made their way to Kirsten's room and the pair went inside and the doctors that were in there would say that Elizabeth looked terrified. She was hunched over and kind of slouched down and she wouldn't make eye contact with any of the doctors. And as she was standing there looking at her terribly sick daughter, the doctors began asking her, do you know of any underlying health problems your daughter might have that might help us treat her more effectively. And Elizabeth was so scared she couldn't even talk. And at some point the questions became too much for her and she just turned around and walked out into the hall with Joseph. And once they got out into the hall, the police were waiting for them. They had been tipped off as soon as the doctor saw Joseph and Elizabeth come into the hospital. Elizabeth and Joseph were detained and brought to the police station where they were put in two separate rooms to be interviewed. They first interviewed Elizabeth. And initially, just like in the hospital room, she was totally mute and didn't say anything. Then for five hours, the police grilled her with questions. Where had she been for the last 24 years? What happened to Kirsten? Did she have something to do with her illness? And they kept reminding her throughout these five hours that if she never gave them any information and God forbid something were to happen to Kirsten, she, Elizabeth, could be held criminally liable. And so eventually Elizabeth in a very small, meek voice said, okay, I'll tell you the story, but you have to promise me I never have to see my father, Joseph, ever again. When she said this to the police, they could tell she was so scared that they said, okay, fine. You never have to see your father again. We'll make sure of it. Now tell us what happened. After that, Elizabeth clutched her hands. She took a deep breath. And then she told them one of the most horrifying stories they had ever heard. A story so disturbing that it would make headlines all around the world for months. It all began 24 years earlier on August 28th, 1984, the day Elizabeth went missing. On that day, she told police she was at her family home in Amstetten when her father asked her to come into the basement to help him with something. Her father, for the last several years, had been constructing a bomb shelter in their basement, and he was now only one door installation away from being done. At the time, in the early 1980s, the Cold War was still very much on, and so building bomb shelters inside of your home was a relatively common thing. So Elizabeth goes down into her basement and she sees her father standing in front of this empty frame where this door is going to go that leads into the shelter. And so she walks over and steps through the frame into the shelter. She turns around and her father hands her this door and she holds it in the middle of the frame while he secures it to the hinges. And then once it's securely in place, suddenly he swings open the door, knocking Elizabeth backwards farther into the shelter. And before she could stand back up again, her father had run inside and pushed an ether soaked towel onto her face, knocking her unconscious. When she came to again, she found herself chained up in the very back room of the shelter. It would turn out this bomb shelter that Joseph had spent six years constructing was not actually a bomb shelter. 
it was a prison he was building specifically for Elizabeth. To get into this shelter, you would have to go down the steps into the basement, which looked like a typical unfinished basement. And then on the far wall, you would see these shelves that had things like paint cans and screwdrivers and other tools you would expect to find in a basement. But if you walked over to the left side of the shelving, there was a lock on the back of it that if you undid it, the shelf itself would swing out like a door and then behind it on the wall would reveal a three foot tall secret door. This secret door was also locked, but not by a key lock. Instead, it was locked by a keypad lock that only Joseph had the code to. And since Joseph was an electrical engineer, he took great care in ensuring this lock never could be tampered with or destroyed. That thing was going to stay locked unless he unlocked it. When Joseph entered his code into the keypad, he could open that secret door and it would reveal this secret underground prison that was basically a winding maze of small rooms with ceilings that were too short to be able to stand up all the way in. If you walked through the secret door and actually entered into this prison, you would start by entering this soundproof narrow hallway that went on for several feet before it entered into this very small bathroom area where the bathroom was unbelievably cramped and there was no doors, there was no privacy. And then if you didn't stop in the bathroom, and you just kept walking straight through that first hallway, you would reach another hallway that was totally soundproof and narrow. And at the end of that hallway, it would feed into a very small bedroom that was so small that it barely contained the one bed that was inside of it. And then off to the right side of that bedroom was another door that led into a similarly sized bedroom. All of the walls of this underground prison were made of thick reinforced concrete. That combined with the soundproofing that Joseph had installed throughout the entire prison meant no one could hear Elizabeth's cries for help. Also, the inside of the prison was heavily monitored by Joseph's security system. So truly, Elizabeth had absolutely no privacy. She was completely trapped and the only way she was getting out was if her father freed her. For the first five years of her imprisonment, she remained in that dungeon all alone. Her only connection to the outside world was her father, who would come down almost every night to drop off basic supplies and to assault her. As far as Joseph's wife and his other kids knew, he was just spending all this time in the basement because that's where he worked when he was not at the office. In 1988, Elizabeth became pregnant with her father's child. She was terrified of the pregnancy and begged Joseph to at least allow her to deliver the child in a hospital hospital but he refused. He wasn't willing to potentially expose himself for what he was doing. And so he gave her a book about childbirth and he gave her a pair of scissors to cut the umbilical cord and he said, good luck. And so on August 30th, Elizabeth delivered her daughter, Kirsten, alone in that basement. Following the birth of Kirsten, Elizabeth would deliver six more of her father's children, all the same way she delivered Kirsten, alone and in the basement. In 1996, one of Elizabeth's newborn babies, Michael, was born with respiratory issues. And so Elizabeth pleaded with Joseph to take the baby to the hospital to get help, but Joseph refused. He was worried he would be exposed. And so three days after his birth, the baby died in Elizabeth's arms. And after the baby died, Joseph just took the body, threw it in a stove, and incinerated it like it was nothing. In the late 90s, the six living children down in the basement were getting bigger and noisier. And so Joseph came up with a plan in order to reduce the chances of them being discovered. And so one day, Joseph went downstairs into the basement and he took one of a Elizabeth's youngest children away from her. And then he threatened her and the rest of the kids down there that if they tried to fight back or if they ever tried to escape, he would seal off the basement and he would gas them to death. Previously, Joseph had punished the entire family by turning off their power and cutting off their food and water supply for multiple days at a time. So they knew he was willing and able to hurt them if he wanted to. And so when he took this young child away from Elizabeth, they didn't put up a fight and the baby disappeared upstairs. And when Joseph's wife, Rosemary, came home, he put on this elaborate charade about how he had discovered this baby on the front step and that there was a note attached to the baby and it was from Elizabeth, their missing daughter, and this child was apparently Elizabeth's and she couldn't take care of it and she was leaving it here for he and Rosemary to raise it as their own. And Joseph had actually made Elizabeth write out this note and sign it to add credibility to the story. And so when Elizabeth's mother, Rosemary, saw this note and heard Joseph's story, she believed it. Over the next several years, Joseph would steal two more of Elizabeth's young children and then stage having found them on his front step with a note from Elizabeth. And with each discovered child, Rosemary amazingly never asked any questions. She just took these kids in and she and Joseph raised them as their own. Eventually, when these three kids got old enough, Joseph would tell them that their real mother, Elizabeth, was a low life and she had abandoned them and she didn't care about them. When in reality, their mother and their other three siblings, they didn't know exactly 
existed were locked up in the basement below their feet. Initially, investigators believed all of these children Joseph had with Elizabeth were all mistakes, but it would turn out that was not the case. Joseph would admit that the reason he initially imprisoned Elizabeth was because he wanted to completely control her. He wanted to own her. And so he decided that if he could just impregnate her as many times as possible and make her have all these kids, even if she eventually got out of the prison, no man would want her. She had too many kids, and so she would remain his property. And so over the entire time Elizabeth was imprisoned, over two decades, the nightly assaults by her father never slowed down. They happened thousands of times. But despite the horrific and tragic circumstances surrounding each of her children's births, she loved her children unconditionally and would spend all of her time doing her best to educate them and care for them. The three children that remained with her that were not taken by Joseph, she taught them how to read and how to write. And when Joseph had given them a TV and a radio to keep down there, she would use those two items to try to teach her kids about the outside world, and she would promise them that someday they would get to experience it for real. Finally, in 2008, so 24 years after Elizabeth had originally been captured by her father, her oldest daughter, Kirsten, becomes extremely sick, and Elizabeth convinces Joseph to bring her to the hospital. And one week later, Joseph's heinous crimes were revealed to the world. Once police found out about the secret prison, they rushed to the house and they went downstairs and they used the codes and instructions that Joseph had given them and they went inside and they freed the last two remaining children that were still there. When they brought them to the hospital, the youngest of these two kids, who was five years old, he didn't speak the entire time. He just pressed his face up against the glass of the car window and he stared out in utter amazement because to that point in his life, he had never actually seen the world. After those two kids were brought to the hospital, they were reunited with the other three siblings that had been taken away from them years ago to live upstairs with Joseph and Rosemary. And apparently the reunion was very emotional and the kids were extremely happy to see each other. And then a couple days later, Kirsten would come out of her coma and she too would have a chance to be reunited with all of her siblings. Kirsten would ultimately make a full recovery. It would turn out she was suffering from a severe vitamin D deficiency. And vitamin D you primarily get from the sun and and in her 19 years of life, she had never been in the sun. As soon as the story broke about this family being trapped inside of this basement, everybody had the same question. How could Elizabeth's mother, Rosemary, not know what was going on in her basement? But the police had the same suspicions about Rosemary, and they investigated her, and they ruled her out. And they said she's not at fault here, she's a victim too. She had been so badly abused by Joseph that she lived in fear of him. And so when he forbade her from ever going anywhere near the basement, she listened. And if she ever heard any strange sounds coming out of the basement, or if she ever suspected any strange behavior by Joseph, she kept those thoughts to herself because she was scared. It's also worth noting that in those 24 years that Elizabeth and her kids were trapped in the basement, Joseph had over 100 people rent out a room inside of his house that was right over the basement. And in those 24 years, not one of those tenants ever said Joseph was acting strangely or complained about strange noises coming from the basement. However, one tenant who was there for a four year stretch had a dog with him the whole time. And every night the dog at some point would suddenly stand up, its ears would prick up and it would start growling like it heard or it saw something. And at first this tenant would try to see what the dog had seen or heard but after never seeing anything, he would always just dismiss the dog when it did this at night. Later on, when that tenant figured out what was actually happening inside the house while he was there, he realized his dog was most likely hearing the faint sounds of the family that was imprisoned right below him. After a year of therapy and rehabilitation, Elizabeth and her six kids were given new identities by the Austrian government, and they were sent off to a secret location to start their lives over. As such, there's virtually no information about how they're doing today. However, anonymous sources have come forward and said the family has successfully reintegrated into society and they are all leading relatively normal and happy lives. As for Joseph, he was quickly given a life sentence and today he is one of the most hated people in his prison due to the nature of his crimes. He is so hated that in 2016, when he was out in general population, he was attacked by other inmates and had several of his teeth knocked out. And so now prison officials are worried if they leave him in general population, he'll be killed and so he spends virtually all of his time in solitary confinement. He will be eligible for parole in 2024 when he is 89 years old. So that's gonna do it guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section.
If you got something out of today's video and you haven't done this already, please secretly teach the like button's parrot to scream obscenities every time the like button is on a work call. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three or four video uploads. touch with me you can direct message me on instagram or on twitter my username for both platforms is the same it's john ballin 416 i also have a ton of content over on tiktok where my username is mr ballin i also have a second youtube channel called mr ballin shorts where i post random short videos and lost episodes if you have a story suggestion please submit it to our subreddit just called mr ballin it's linked in the description below so whether i see you on instagram twitter tiktok reddit youtube or some combination just know that i really appreciate your support and until next time, that's going to do it. See ya. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring today's video. Back in 2017, I had just gotten out of the military after seven years of service. And honestly, it was a huge struggle trying to reintegrate back into civilian life. Not only was I totally out of the loop with modern technology, but I also had no idea how to get a job or even how to identify what a good job was. I just felt lost. And so that, combined with dark thoughts swirling around my head from previous deployments, made it so I really couldn't even function. And so before long, I was jobless, depressed, and angry. But I didn't tell anyone. Even though I had been raised in a household where talking about your feelings was a very normal thing. But now that I really needed to do that, I just couldn't. But luckily, my family and friends noticed the big change in my behavior, and ultimately they convinced me to go seek out professional help. And I'm so glad I did, because it was such a relief. Speaking to a neutral, trained third party about your darkest thoughts is so cathartic and really promotes healing. And while of course therapy is not some one-size-fits-all solution, it is a great starting point for anybody who's struggling right now. And a great option for therapy is BetterHelp, which is entirely online. All you have to do is fill out a quick survey online, and then very quickly you'll be paired with a licensed BetterHelp therapist who is trained to listen and give you unbiased advice. Let BetterHelp connect you with a therapist who can support you all from the comfort of your own home. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Mr. Ballin or select Mr. Ballin during sign up to enjoy a special discount on your first month. Are you a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious? If you are, then you're in luck. Because our very popular Strange, Dark, and Mysterious podcast, called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, is no longer exclusively on Amazon Music. It is now available on all podcast platforms, and it's free. So, if you haven't listened to the Mr. Ballin Podcast since it went exclusive in 2022 with Amazon, well, buckle up, because now there's over 200 episodes on this show, and many of them have never been told on YouTube. They are only available on the podcast, and you got all of them right now to go binge. You can find those special podcast exclusive episodes just by looking for the words podcast exclusive in the individual episode title. So again, the chart topping, highly popular Mr. Ballin podcast is once again available on all podcast platforms and it's free. To listen, just search for the Mr. Ballin podcast on Amazon Music or wherever else you listen to your podcasts and then give the show a follow and start listening. Also, if you're one of the amazing people who continued listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast on Amazon Music when it went exclusive, well, don't give up your subscription just yet because there are still major perks for people listening to the show on Amazon Music. With your Prime membership, you can listen to brand new episodes of the Mr. Ballin podcast 
30 days earlier and ad-free on Amazon Music. But again, the show is available on all podcast platforms and it's free, so go enjoy. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's story, be sure to check out our podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, where we have literally hundreds more stories, a lot like this one, but many of those stories are only available on the podcast. Again, it's called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, and you can listen to it on Amazon Music or wherever else you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. Until next time, see ya. Wait, don't go anywhere. If you're looking for more strange, dark, and mysterious videos, click here. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comment section. If you got something out of today's video and you haven't done this already, please invite the like button over to your house for a family dinner party and proceed to serve them a significantly oversalted dish. But before they take a bite out of it, make sure you say that you're so proud of what you've cooked and you can't wait to get their feedback. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three or four video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. I also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts where I post random short videos and lost episodes. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.